Ayanda, and I will be hosting uh, this particular session uh, today. As I said, I will be hosting this particular session today um, and welcome to everybody who has joined us. We have really a jam-packed uh, uh, session uh, with regards to our game changer. But before I introduce the game changer, I would just firstly one, um, like to introduce myself again because we are now uh, live on Facebook. And when I said my name, we were not live. Uh, my name is Ayanda and I'm with I AISCA um, in terms of the African Institute for Supply Chain Research. And uh, AISCA is hosting this particular game changer as we have been doing um, for this, actually for this whole year. Some of the housekeeping that I would just like to attend to before I introduce the topic today is that one, um, yes, we will be recording this session. If anyone is interested in the recording of the session, they can contact AISCA um, through the website um, and also via email uh, if they would like to get a recording of the particular session. We are live in terms of Facebook currently, um, as, as well as um, other media. We will try and get any questions from those other media um, as we go through our session. You'll also note that um, we will ask that you, one, uh, place yourself on mute um, whilst we have our spectacular presenters uh, presenting today um, and, and the discussion. But we will um, we welcome you to one, uh, go to the chat if you'd like to put a comment or a question. But we're also going to definitely give you an opportunity at the end of the, the discussion to participate in the discussion, ask questions, and you'll be able to take yourself on mute and ask yourself, uh, ask any questions that you might have. You might find that you, you by mistake, you get yourself off mute. We may then put you on mute. It doesn't mean that you must be silent for the whole session, um, but uh, rather you, you, you can um, take yourself off mute at the end of the session. Furthermore, you do not have to have your cameras on. Um, we do understand in terms of bandwidth. Um, so you, you do not have to, but if you feel when you want to ask a question that you want to place your camera on, you're also welcome to do so. And I'll remind everyone again, as I can see some of our colleagues have already started doing so, you can utilize the chat. We will definitely be monitoring the chat. And if for some reason you can't ask a question uh, live, we will then ask the question um, at the end, uh, because we will be monitoring the chats. Now, like I said, and I did come through quite excited, we are having our October uh, Game Changer series. And today we're going to be looking at what municipalities can do to transform their supply chains and improve audit outcomes. We have every year within the municipalities, the Auditor General uh, presents their findings and you hear about so many municipalities that actually don't get clean audits, their issues. And today we're really going to be unpacking the reasons why we're going to be looking in terms of what we need to do as professionals within supply chain. And we have three really dynamic um, speakers with a wealth of experience um, within supply chain and quite specifically also within municipalities from ranging from auditing to capacity building. So today is the day I, I should actually invite the Auditor General and all the municipal employees to come and join because we really have an opportunity to, for um, experts to impart uh, knowledge and also just share their learnings that they have experienced um, throughout their journeys in this particular uh, area. So who are the three speakers and what will we be talking about? As I said, the main topic is what municipalities can do to transform their supply chains and improve audit outcomes. And we have three uh, panelists this afternoon. Um, we have uh, Mohammed Lohat, um, who's going to firstly be talking and just setting the scene and giving us in terms of the state of municip municipal supply chains in South Africa. And he comes with really extensive um, uh, knowledge, 
particularly in um, municipal audit support. Um, he's with uh, Salga and he's a specialist. And he and he's, as you can see, um, in, in terms, as you will see when he does his presentation, really extensive knowledge in the, in the municipal sector, local government, auditing of municipalities, governance, financial management. Once he set the scene in terms of the state of the municipal supply chains in South Africa, we're gonna hand over to, to, to Mark, who's gonna be talking about benchmarking municipal supply chain practices and strategies and what South Africa uh, could do. And Mark is going to be sharing because he's uh, has a, is a senior consultant at Icarus and he's focusing on public financial management. He and uh, public procurement extensive experience in terms of capacity development in that area. Uh, he has extensive over 19 years experience with technical experience in one, not just uh, general capacity development, but implementing and designing. He understands what the issues are. He looks in terms of how then we can improve the cap uh, capability and the performance of various state organs. And really um, one of the big players in, in the in the space of uh, municipality capacity management and supply chain um, and worked as a consultant in various uh, organizations and um, those in the space will know um, uh, Mark and know of his name. Then we're going to end off our session with his uh, Dr. Len, as he's affectionately uh, called, and he's going to look is professionalization the solution to transform to the transformation of municipal supply chains and to improve audit outcomes. Uh, Dr. Len also has led a consultant and manage um, is a lead consultant and managing director of Ultimate Consulting Solutions with a huge focus on local governance, public administration, supply chain management. He has, I'm going to give the years over 33 years. So Dr. Len, you've just exposed yourself uh, in the public sector uh, with extensive um, history within supply chain management, both at a practical and theoretical level um, and has approached the subject as a municipal manager, a consultant, uh, as well as a, a senior lecturer in, in the space. The three speakers, as I've indicated in terms of introduction, really are the pillars in terms of this particular topic. Um, and we are really honored to have them join us um, and share their knowledge as they really take us through um, the municipalities and assist us in transforming our supply chains and then take us in that direction where we will eventually all municipalities will have clean audits and the area of supply chain will be something that is talked about and raved about uh, and celebrated um, in, in the future. With that, I'm going to hand over to Mohammed and ask him to then take us through the state of municipal supply chain in South Africa. Mohammed, over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ayanda, and good afternoon, uh, uh, colleagues. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity, uh, and thank you very much to the a AISCR for, for, for inviting uh, Salga to participate on in this Game Changer series. Uh, yeah, I thought, let me just on, oh, you know, just put on the camera just for a minute or two, so you can actually put a face to the voice. But if you don't mind, uh, we are having load shading now, so I'd rather just uh, switch it off when I'm doing the presentation or, or I'm likely to run into some challenges as well. So thank you for that. Um, without any further ado, let me quickly share the document. Sorry, before I carry on, am I audible first of all? And then also just to just check, is the, is the presentation reflecting on your side? So yes, yes you are audible. And yes, the presentation is reflecting on our side. Thank you very much, okay. Mohammed. Thank you. I just want to check if it's moving as well. Right now, it is not moving. We it's, it's still in non-presentation mode, um, but it is not moving. Oh. Okay. Will it assist? Uh, if do you would you like me to share the presentation? Or if you don't mind, please. Okay, just give me half a second. You can introduce your topic whilst I pop it up. 
All right. No, thank you so much. So, 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 thank you very much, colleagues. I think, as 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 Ayanda has indicated, um, I will I will basically be at a very high level trying to set the scene uh, in terms of the actual topic itself, in terms of how do we what municipality should be doing to transform in terms of supply chain management, and how can this basically assist them to improve their audit outcomes as well. Um, yeah, and and maybe uh, maybe maybe just yeah while 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 the presentation is coming up. Um, yeah. So, so quickly from the South African. Yeah. So I'm from the South African Local Government Association, and maybe just as a start, um, the the if you can go on to the next next slide, please. It's basically the um, to start off with the Salga mandate. Um, so at a very high level, Salga's mandate focuses on six broad pillars. Um, yeah, and, and, and those pillars are basically um, lobbying, advocating, and representing for local government. There's an employ, employer body, body role as well. There's also capacity building, support and advice, strategic profiling, as well as knowledge and information sharing. So the, the, the practice of supply chain management uh, fits in very, very well, basically, I think actually in five, in five of those um, six mandates that we have as, as, as the South African Local Government Association itself. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, on the, on the specific slide. So obviously the lobbying, advocating and, and representing, we play a role in terms of that and the, the issue of capacity building, support and advice, strategic profiling, as well as knowledge and information sharing with regards to, to SCM itself. Thank you. So just in terms of some background, um, you know, with regards to the, the setting the scene for the audit outcomes, you know, and, and, and just at a very high level. So this is a five-year profile of the audit outcomes in the, in, in, in the municipal environment, uh, or what we call the MFMA audit outcomes that Auditor General reports on. And as you can see, generally the, the, the numbers have remained quite stagnant in a way. So you've been, you, you've had some, some years where there've been improvements, some years where there've been regressions, but by and large, your, your number of lists, and, and obviously, if just to you know, spend a minute or two on the slide, the green, the green ones are obviously the best outcomes to get, which is basically unqualified with no findings or the so-called clean audits that the Auditor General refers to in South Africa. The yellow ones are unqualified, but with some findings. Um, and then the rest of them are basically the not so good out outcomes. So you've got your qualifications, which is the blue. The pinkish ones are your adverse audit opinions. The red is your disclaimers. And then the ones right at the bottom, the white ones, are basically those audits which were not finalized in terms of, of the legislative timeframes that is set out in terms of our Municipal Financial Management Act uh, for audits itself. So, you know, by and large, if you look at it, there's around 50% plus municipalities. It started off at the beginning of the term with 57%, which were unqualified or better. It ended off at around 55%. And in between, it went up or down here and there. But by and large, it's basically quite stayed quite sort of uh, stagnant. There's been obviously maybe a slight regression or a slight improvement in an overall level, but that is the, the, the outcomes, you know, the picture that we paint. Obviously, from an from a overall perspective, we would like to see, obviously, the bulk of, of municipalities or outcomes in the yellow and the green uh, in terms of those bars and, and almost next to nothing in the others. But unfortunately, the this current split is more 50-50 um, you know, at an overall level, more or less, compared to, to what we would like. Okay, the next next slide, please. Yeah, I think this is a slide I would really spend a bit of time on. Um, and this one here basically is a slide that we, we borrowed from the Auditor General. So just to give them the credit as well for, for this specifically. So what happens normally at the end of every audit cycle, so before the Auditor General presents to the public, they also have engagements directly with stakeholders like Salga and others, where they give us a little, little bit more detail in terms of the different you know, uh, areas of qualifications, and challenges that they've picked up in the actual audit process. So this one here talks specifically to, to, to the issue of, of what, what, we, what, we, what we're looking at in terms of the weaknesses in procurement and payment processes um, that, that they've picked up in, in terms of the actual audits itself. And if you look at the bars on the top, so in the 2020-2021 financial year, which is the last audit cycle which was completed, you can see that of the audits that were completed by the time this report was presented, 63% of municipalities had material findings in terms of complying with supply chain management regulations. 26% of them had findings, which may not have been material, but there were findings there. And only 11% of municipalities had no findings on SCM legislation compliance specifically. Now, I think 
just in terms of what does this translate to effectively, uh, is basically translate into basically, if you have payments for goods and services not received or of poor quality, it basically also talks about you could have overpayment of suppliers, you could have payments to incorrect suppliers or beneficiaries, they may have been contracted payments for incomplete or non-existing construction where there was construction contracts, uh, you know, being being uh, uh, being being actually followed. Uh, there's also been extension of construction contracts resulting in higher costs than what was anticipated initially. Payments for services not rendered, and basically the impact of all of this is financial losses, which reduces the funds for service delivery. And in terms of what's driving the irregular expenditure, um, and this is also quite interesting to note. So procurement without competitive bidding or, or quotation processes represented 19% of cases, and there were 130 municipalities that, I, that were identified in terms of this. Non-compliance with procurement process requirements equated to 13.6 billion rands, and this was basically at 204 municipalities. Now, this is the largest proportion in terms of the drivers of irregular expenditure. And again, um, you know, things like this, where you've got a procurement process requirement which is not being adhered to, is not things that that are what you can say is not always difficult to do. So these are let's call it compliant things that should be happening as long as you've done your planning appropriately. These things should be you know as part of the course of the process should be easily be able to be adhered to. But unfortunately, what's been picked up is that quite there's quite a bit of non-compliance with the preferential preferential procurement regulations. That is the one thing that they've picked up. There was also issues where tax matters were not in order, so there wasn't tax clearance certificates available for some of the actual suppliers which were appointed to actually you know, uh, conduct or undertake the services. And then also non-compliance with legislated requirements for procurement through contracts secured by other organs of state. So for example, where there was you know, transversal contracts or, or sometimes where they, we call it the so-called piggy, piggybacking in terms of you know, contracts secured by other organs of state, there was also the, the, the proper process in terms of trying to do that piggybacking wasn't followed in terms of these things. And we'll, we'll touch a little bit on some of these things as we go to the presentation, but this, is, this, this, this slide encapsulates in, 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 in a graphic way some of the key issues that currently is being faced in the supply chain management uh, arena in local government itself. Okay, so if you move on to the next, next uh, couple of slides, is basically then looking at from a SAGA perspective, you know, we've identified it obviously the supply chain management uh, weaknesses or challenges are an issue. And obviously we need to try and address these things in terms of a program of action. So, so yeah, uh, we've then, we've developed something called a municipal order support program at SAGA. Um, it's basically underpinned by four broad pillars being financial management, leadership, governance, and institutional capacity. We also collaborate very, very closely with other stakeholders like your treasuries, COCTAs, the Auditor General themselves, um, as well as you know, a number of donor organizations as well, like GIZ um, and, and, and others you know, from other countries as well. Um, and yeah, and, and the whole idea is to basically try and improve financial management governance, et cetera, in municipalities, with the whole idea that it will be able to yeah. develop or in, in improving mm. their service as well. Okay. Okay. There is some basic, some basic, yeah, next slide. some basic behaviors. Yeah. So basically, the next couple, next two slides, just basically outlines for each of those pillars in the municipal order support program. What are some of the activities that we actually, uh, you know, undertake as 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 a South African local government association? Um, so maybe just yeah, we can just. Uh, skip through these two. Uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time on it. This is just for for noting as well. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and, and to the next one. Yeah. So so I think the next one is this is very very important. So one of the things that the auditor general also picks up, uh, and and it talks to specifically the the number of orders that have disclaimer audit opinions, and also potentially those that have to an extent adverse audit opinions as well. Um, is basically the issue with regards to records management. Now, records management is, is fundamentally important in, a, in, 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 any, in any organization, but obviously in a public sector environment, it's much more important as well. Because obviously when, when, when you are undertaking your, your operations in the organization, you need to have the records in place, obviously from an operational perspective, but also for the audit process itself. So obviously when the AG comes to do an audit and they request for certain things, especially when it comes to, for example, uh, you know, procurement that has happened, if it's like a specific tender, 
they want to request they would like all the documentation to be to be to be available for them to be you know to do undertake the audit processes it's, it's just we just find it very very fascinating that that municipalities sometimes are not able to provide these documents and sometimes it's basic things like you know give us the contract we can't find it give us the invoices we can't find it give us whatever whatever you can to basically justify or give us you know uh, a evidence that that whatever you are you are recording in your financial statements or if you've undertaken for example a procurement process and you've appointed you know a uh, service provider a to for us to be able to see that the process was done in terms of it compliance with it, it complied with the legislation it complied with your policies etc uh, but you find that the municipalities aren't able to always do that but obviously this is fundamentally important it, it has an impact directly on the scm finding but it also has an impact broadly on your audit outcomes as well so obviously this is something we've also identified and and uh, if you can go to the next uh, next slide please uh, so what we have done in terms of trying to address it we've we've put together uh, or we've developed a records management toolkit in collaboration with the auditor generals themselves so you know we 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 had a discussion with them we said you know you're raising this point year in and year out we also acknowledge it is an issue so let's work together and let's put something together to help the municipality they agreed with us we 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 funded a, a project together we put together the toolkit and we've now disseminated it to all municipalities we we've also had training sessions on it in the previous uh, financial year which ended march 2022 we also then planning to have another round of of training on on the toolkit and just broad financial i mean sorry records management practices in terms of what should be done how should you do it etc uh, in this in this kind of financial year as well so that's just to 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 note as well with regards to records management which is something to, to consider uh, next one please yeah then the other aspect obviously we've picked up is that when in in a municipal environment itself it's very very important that that your your political leg or your political arm in a municipality understands what their roles are how they should be applying their roles and also very very importantly that they don't overstep their roles as well so especially in the scm space uh you know we uh, i always i always remember that there, there is a counselor that 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 is a very very you know he's been around for many many years uh in, in our houting salga uh office and he always talks about the issue of oversight versus aftersight and he says that no 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 why why should we come in after the fact and why can't we be part of the process you know from the beginning so we have to try and explain to him to say but you know in, in terms of the way the governance is set up you are not you cannot be a referee and player so obviously if you're going to be a referee if you're going to be trying to do oversight over something or you you've got to basically let let the process run its course so like in a game as well you can't basically have the referee also taking free kicks and penalties otherwise you know he, he'll award it to himself or his team and it won't be fair so it's a very same principle to apply in this thing to say that obviously as 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 the person who's maybe the impact chair person or in the impact members or whether you are a portfolio committee member in finance or just a counselor in general you have a role to play from an oversight perspective you need to understand what the role is you need to then apply whatever you know you need to ask the right questions so you need to have a basic understanding of what you should be looking for what you should be asking about etc and then you shouldn't be getting involved in the operational aspects itself so i think that's that's the whole idea about this so obviously we we've, we've taken this on board and then from a saga perspective again you know when when councillors are appointed from the time they start the the, the term of office we have a general induction we then follow that up very very closely with what we call portfolio specific induction where we then take councillors who have been uh, allocated or have been uh, assigned to specific portfolios in terms of what their requirements are what should they be doing what shouldn't they be doing etc and we take them through so obviously in, in our case in the finance field we take them through the whole finance function both all the way from budgeting all the way to reporting so they understand the different you know accountability uh, responsibilities that they have and also the whole cycle in terms of revenue expenditure supply chain asset management etc cetera, etc cetera. what should they be doing what should they be doing what should they be asking about and this, and, and and those things so there's also another thing that 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 you know from uh, from that perspective if this thing can be improved it will also assist in reducing the extent of audit poor audit findings and also reducing the extent of of findings generally with scm as well uh, in terms of poor findings regarding scm as well okay so we go to the next one please okay yeah oh. and this one here is the one that the, the the public seems to 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 just wait for you know so when the ag does their report 
the the one the one the one uh, aspect that the media latches onto every every year and and is a big focus is basically the whole issue regarding unauthorized irregular fruitless and wasteful expenditure as well um and again you know for, for colleagues who, who, who you are well versed in the scm space you you understand that obviously the irregular expenditure the, the bulk of it basically is due to transgressions with the scm policies and processes um, and obviously, you know, if a municipality has incurred these things, we understand it's not always avoidable. It has something it does take place, you know, they, due to whatever reasons. But I think what's very, very important and what, what, what we've been trying to, to communicate to our members and to our councillors and to our officials is that two things are very, very important. Number one is prevention is better than cure. So obviously, if you can prevent it, that's the first price. Number two, if you can't prevent it, then at least have systems in place to identify it report on it appropriately and address it appropriately. But I think that's where the AG's biggest issue comes in, where you'll find a municipality who's reported, maybe like just I'm just giving high level numbers, they've reported 10 million rand of irregular expenditure, and that's all they reported that they've picked up during the year. The AG, during the course of the audit, you know, doing the sampling, et cetera, they pick up a number of, of, of uh, different tenders, they audit those tenders, they audit other procurement, and then suddenly they pick up just in the sample they've selected, they've picked up a further maybe 100, 120 million rand worth of irregular expenditure. Now, obviously it raises, it raises alarm bells because obviously it means that the systems, it, because remember they order stuff after the fact. So obviously those processes have taken place, but what it means is that the system in place in the actual municipality itself is not robust enough to identify that there was a transgression in the processes and it should have been flagged as irregular expenditure and then obviously dealt with accordingly. So I think the one point that the AG has also been trying to, you know, when we met with them, they understand that it's not always possible, even a clean audit municipality sometimes, there is a level uh, of irregular expenditure that may be incurred by them. But the big difference is they have picked it up themselves as a municipality and they have taken adequate steps to address it. So it's been investigated, there's been a decision made whether to write it off or to recover it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I think that's just the thing to, to point out that, that, that that's the other thing that, that, that we're focusing on from a startup perspective. We're working very closely with the National Treasury as well. They, they're on a, on a very big drive in terms of what they call, um, I won't call it game changers, but yeah, it is a game changer as well. But one of the things they're looking at is, is the reduction of irregular expenditure uh, of 75% in, 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 in the medium term and, and the eradication totally of fruitless and wasteful expenditure as well. So obviously we are we, we, we joining them on the journey because I think it's, it's, it's something that we would like to also have. It'll benefit the local government uh, sphere as well. So again, when we're having our capacity building sessions, et cetera, with municipalities, both officials and councillors, we work closely with Treasury in terms of the UIF and, and W reduction strategies. And in terms of trying to see that, you know, as, as I discussed earlier, the two very important messages, prevention is better than cure. And in price number two, or the second, you know, the runner up, if you can't get that is at least have robust enough systems to identify, report and deal with it appropriately. Don't wait for the agents to do it for you because then it's too late. Okay, uh, then the next one, please. Yeah, okay, so Sonia, we can just go through it uh, quickly. This is basically just, just talking about that. Uh, oh, sorry, not, no, no, I, not to go quickly. I think we will spend maybe a minute or two on this one. It's also important. It's just obviously important that that we have the right people with the right skills to do the right to do the functions that they, 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 they are performing. Um, this is this is obviously true for SCM, but also true for the entire finance function. So I know later on we're having we're having uh, uh, Dr. Len who will be talking about professionalization and whether really it's 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 uh, it's the way to go and it can basically address the issue. And I think uh, yeah, obviously he, he will present obviously in more detail. But from our perspective, you know, from a other perspective as well, we've identified that obviously the need to have the right people with the right skills and the right knowledge is vitally important. Uh, because obviously, they, they, and also if they can belong to a professional body, et cetera, it does, make, it does make a difference to an extent. Because obviously then they come with the prerequisite knowledge and experience in terms of what is required. And that can't be an excuse for not performing. Thereafter, if you don't perform, then it could be due to negligence, delinquency, whatever it may be. And then again, if you belong to a professional body, then there's obviously, you know, potentially in terms of your code of conduct, et cetera, there could be certain consequence management that could be applied to try and address that sort of, uh, you know, inappropriate behavior, et cetera, as well. 
Okay, and then just yeah, well, the one thing I wanted to just we, we we try to raise on this slide as well. We've also developed something called a good practice guide on municipal financial management. Mm -hmm. And again, it touches on the entire ambit from budgeting all the way to reporting, and it covers in a different thematic areas. SCMG one of them, where we go through in detail regarding what you should be responsible for, what you should be doing uh, from an official's perspective, from a, a councillor perspective. And then we also we did, we went one step further in, in this guide where we also identified specific municipalities who have been exhibiting good practice in different thematic areas. And we actually then, um, in a way, how do you say, we, we interviewed them and, 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 and got out from them, you know, what are the practices that they do? Or from a practical point of view, how do they ensure in that specific thematic area that they are getting it right most of the time? Um, and and just, just so we can also share with other municipalities, and also in a way like you know peer learning to an extent but also to inspire the others who say like you know you, it, it can be possible and what's fascinating is that some of the municipalities that are profiled in this guide are not like your urban and metros etc some of them are quite rural small municipalities but it's just that they, they they have this willingness to do the right thing there's the right leadership tone at the top and the people who are who are doing the stuff is qualified committed etc and and obviously uh, they, they then just share the experiences in terms of how they're managing to do it on a regular basis uh, next one, please. Yeah, now talking specifically to SCM, um, one of the things we have also then done from the Salga perspective, uh, you know, I think two or three years back, our, our Salga NEC tasked us to go and identify a professional body that we can partner with in terms of SCM. And then we basically went into the market and then we identified that, you know, CIPS is, is, is a SEQA recognized official body for, for procurement and supply. We then had engagements with them, entered into an MOA with them, and we now, we now have a formalized MOA with, with SIPS. And the whole idea is then for us to then promote membership of a professional body in the SCM space to municipalities. We the whole idea that obviously officials or incumbents in that space, if they don't belong to a professional body already, Hopefully they can consider taking up membership, et cetera, and it can hopefully then help them to improve and professionalize in that perspective as well. And also, you know, it comes with both, both, ben both benefit and, and also consequence management. So, you know, again, um, we're hoping that it'll, it'll ultimately in the longer run help to improve the, the uh, you know, the actual performance of the SCM colleagues and obviously the skills and knowledge as well in terms of the space. Um, next one, please. Yeah, so, so the next couple of slides, I don't think I want to really talk through it. You, you can see some of the visuals and, and maybe we can just go, you know, slide by slide uh, quickly. But uh, so, so, so the first one is just some examples of where the AG picked up specific things, which you sometimes when you read it, you think to yourself, but huh, how is such things possible? But uh, yeah, but, but so, so the one was, for example, the failure to manage the expenditure of a municipality. Um, yeah, so there's an example talking about uh, what, what happened. Uh, and this is an actual example from the AG's reports itself. Uh, next one, please. Um, there was one again where uh, the, the, when you're fuel, putting fuel into the vehicle as well, there's there's differences between what what was the uh, what was basically claimed for versus the capacity of the actual tank itself. Uh, and you know, it's like it's like things that you, it's not major things, but but it's it's just examples to show that you know. Um, these are the things that basically are picked up, uh, you know, and identified during the audits itself that the AG does. Uh, next one, please. Yeah. So again, um, there was something regarding uh, duplicate transactions for for boreholes, um, and again, the the here the figure is a bit much more is much higher, as well. But there was potentially a duplication of 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 examples, you know, where, where uh, again there was no proper system of controls. For the creditors, uh, next one, please. Mohammed, I'm taking a facilitator privileges and interrupting you, sure. um, and reminding of time. Okay, no, no problem. We, we're almost done. Thank you. Okay, can, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, let's let's move to the next one as well. So the, the, these were just examples of what the AG has picked up. Uh, I didn't want to really. I think this is the one I want to spend a bit more time on as we wrap up. In terms of recommendations, uh, yeah. So the next one, please. Yeah. So basically, what what should we be doing, and how can we, you know, these are just some suggestions and 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 obviously uh, recommendations to consider. 
Um, so obviously the first one is to institute preventative controls and establish the practice of the preventative controls uh, within the municipality. Again, the whole thing talks to that if, if you have these systems in place or the system of preventive controls in place, you should be able to reduce the instances of the transgressions or non-compliances. Um, you may not eradicate it fully, but it will be able to help to, reduct, to reduce that you know, to a certain extent. You need to ensure appropriate skills and knowledge of incumbents in the roles. I think that that talks again to the issue of professionalization and skills. We need to ensure that there's good records management practices that are being applied in municipalities. Um, because again, you know, there they should be no excuse when, when the Auditor General comes to audit, why can't the municipality provide a document that they that is asked for? And you know, the one simple example, just to touch on this one quickly, in our own homes, we like myself, I, I'm sure everybody else does something similar. I have a file at home where all, all important documents are kept in there. So if, if whenever we need something, be it like a license document or a contract, whatever it is, I know where to go find it. I go, it's in there. My wife does the filing, but you know, at least I know it's being done, but it, it's there in that file. Uh, so I'm saying similarly in, in a municipal environment, uh, you know, in, in a corporate environment, you should be able to have the stuff in the place. And also with the laws currently in terms of promotion of access to information act, the promotion, uh, sorry, the, the, the protection of person, person information, the Poppy Act as well. There's, there's requirements now over and above keeping, you know, complying with the AG's uh, request. There's laws for you to be able to, to, that requires you to keep these things appropriately. So there's another reason for this as well. Uh, clarity on procurement regulations are needed from National Treasury. I think this is basically coming through with, with the whole issue that happened over the last couple of months. Uh, you know, where, the way there was, there was a bit of confusion in the market and municipalities were not allowed for a while to, to procure and there was uncertainty. And I think that the, the, the process is still, is still undergo, is, is still, uh, you know, how do I say, rolling out. Uh, but I think before the end of January or so, I think when the court case or when the timeline is set uh, based on the court ruling, we need to have the clarity from Treasury because I think it will also assist us, you know, uh, moving forward as well. The other one is to apply consequence management and accountability sanctions where transgressions are identified. And I think this is not just for SCM alone, but obviously it, it talks to it because it's, there's normally, you know, when you talk about the irregular expenditure, that's where many of it comes from. And, and again, if it's not being dealt with appropriately, then there needs to be consequence management and accountability taken. And obviously, where somebody needs to be charged formally, they need to be charged and, and, and then let the, let the other legal processes take the course as well. Um, the SCM planning needs to be improved so we can reduce or avoid emergency procurement mm -hmm. or unplanned procurement. I think that's just, just, just self explanatory, but I think that's one of the issues that we pick up a lot in, in municipal environments uh, and something we need to look at how we can reduce. Contract management needs to be beefed up. Uh, that's still something which I think many municipalities seem to struggle with, uh, which results in many cases where you know contracts are coming to an end. The process hasn't been done appropriately either to extend or to appoint a new provider. And then it just results in, in requests for deviation and, and other things, which, which if it was done appropriately and planned for appropriately or managed or tracked appropriately, these things could have been avoided as well. And obviously the last one and most importantly is municipalities need to comply with the SCM regulations and policies. And if that happens, obviously we will then have a reduction in terms of the, of the negative you know, findings on SCM. And obviously the negative outcomes, which, which uh, you know, from an audit perspective as well. And I think that's that's the end. Jay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mohammed. And really, thank you for setting the scene with regards to where we are in the state of uh, municipalities. Thank you very much with your expertise from uh, Salga and uh, years and years. Thank you. I'm now going to stop sharing and and hand over to Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to share with you today. And also well done to the Institute for uh, arranging uh, this event. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen now. All right. Uh, are you seeing the slides? Yes, we are perfect, Mark. Thank you. Yes. Um, sorry, it's uh, it's not allowing me to to um, to change the slide. To move. Yeah. 
Not sure why. I'm wondering if it's not some settings because Muhammad seemed to have the same problem. Yeah, you've also got my, my slides. Yes, I do. So just um, perhaps you can introduce the topic whilst I, I pull it up. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just some of my reflections on um, on supply chain um, and perhaps what we need to do um, to to improve SCM and audit outcomes. Okay, um, and yeah, I'm not seeing anything now. I have just booted you out in terms of sharing, um, and I'm now sharing your slides. Okay. Oh, sorry, and I've just moved your slides, sorry. Um, all right, I'm not seeing anything. <laughs> this is so weird. All right, let me just carry on speaking. Um, you're going to have to help me a little bit. Are we okay. are we on on the second slide? Yeah, improved service delivery. There we go. All right. So, what do we want to achieve, and why is SCM so important? Um, I mean, supply chain is there really to to help an organization achieve its objectives. So, we're really there to add value to the department or, or municipality. And if we think about government, we're really there to enhance service delivery. And in order to do that, we do need to build the, the capability within the organization to, um, in a sense, effect uh, public procurement effectively and contribute to, um, yeah, to achieving the objectives of that specific, specific uh, department or ministry or municipality. Now, if you go to the next slide, you will see just a picture of a capacity building model. This is something that we developed uh, at National Treasury, and it's part of the, the National Treasury capacity building strategy. And you'll see in that picture, there are four pillars that, well, we call them pillars. Um, the one is institutional, and that is really about having the right enabling legislative and regulatory environment. The second one is about the organization uh, and the individual. And um, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, uh, on the next slide. Um, and then the last pillar there uh, on the right is stakeholders. And I mean, I think it's fitting that we have Sal Salga with us today because Salga and Cocta and the provincial treasuries, they're all there as stakeholders to support local government uh, to improve their performance, and to deliver services. Um, in, in South Africa, we've got uh, the Intergovernmental Relations Act, which is really uh, asking for government departments to collaborate uh, and cooperate and work together to create synergies. Um, if you think about building a building uh, Mark, in, a, in a, yeah. I'm sorry to disturb you. I can see that from the chats that they are not seeing my slides. Okay, That's so I just like to just check um, if from the room, are you able to see the slides that we are on, which is no. the capacity development no. model? No, I'm suggesting that you put it on, on and then start it again. And then Mark can also put down his from his side, then you can start all over. Thank you. All right. Are Alter you able to see now? Ayanda? Yes. Alternatively, let members go to the view options. They will select Ayanda and Teta instead of Mark. Then they're able to view what you're sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if you work. select, so Mark, well, Mark is unable to remove himself, is what I hear. So yeah, I'm you... suggesting that Max pull down his uh, presentation from sharing mode, and then you can now oh, share. There we Thank go. you. Oh, now I'm back. Okay. Um, I wonder if this is going to work this time. I'm going to stop sharing, Mark. Oops. 
What do you see now? We see your presentation. It is not in presentation mode, but we can see it and we can see your cursor moving. Okay, it should be now. Is it now in presentation mode? No, it is not. Still not. Okay, that's strange. Slide show. Yes, click there where you are. Yes, where you exactly where you are. Click on it. Yeah, it's not doing anything. Oh. Okay, let me, I'll stop sharing. So I've stopped sharing. Okay, I'm going to try and share now. Okay, we will, I mean, we will share the slides with you as well. Um, so you can have a look. So I, I would like the participants to advise if they can see my slides. I can. Yeah. yeah. So if okay. you just step. Perfect. Okay. Just one more. All right. So if we take the capacity building model and we, we, we think about a local government space, um, a local municipality, what, what is the first thing? That we need to do. The first thing is, is to do the diagnostic, to assess where we're at. Uh, we can call that a baseline study. And after we've done the baseline study, we must do continuous monitoring and evaluation. But from our experience in supporting you know, municipalities in South Africa, we found that, that these three key areas are exceptionally weak. Um, the SEM system, your, your policy and standard operating procedures, and processes um, that have been institutionalized within a local government space are often weak and, and not well developed. The organizational structure, um, I sometimes, uh, I had this picture the one time of, of, a, of a tiny little Nissan 1400 Bucky, um, you know, trying to cart this huge mound of, of uh, let's say gravel and, and rubble uh, from one point to another, and it was exceptionally difficult. Um, and, and it's about capacity. Um, if our supply chain units are not structured uh, uh, correctly with the right job descriptions and sufficient staff, they're always going to struggle to uh, perform their functions effectively. So you need the right organizational structure, you need the right job descriptions, um, and then, yes, you need the right skills. And, and Dr. Mortimer is going to talk about professionalization. But I just want to say, I mean, you need technical procurement skills, but you also need certain behavioral competencies and attitudes and ethics. And then you need, on top of that, the management or um, sort of softer, um, let's say, um, competencies. And all of this will also not work uh, if you don't have effective change leadership. Uh, and when I say change leadership, I'm not only talking about an MM and a CFO. It has to filter throughout the municipality. So the executive from the council to the senior management or executive team and to the middle management all need to be on board to drive uh, effective change. If we go to the next slide, um, we recently started putting together um, a, um, a, a knowledge product, kind of a case study, um, looking at IFW reduction. And um, Mohammed shared some of the statistics around the audit findings. Uh, and for some municipalities, I've, you know, um, unauthorized, irregular, fruitless, wasteful expenditure has been growing for years. Um, but we, we, uh, we did a whole lot of um, sort of, let's say, uh, interviews to find out from municipalities what was working well um, and what the critical success factors were that were contributing to IFW reduction. And these are the six sort of critical success factors. And again, you can see, you know, leadership comes out on top, having a, a, an action plan, often that's linked to your audit action plan in place, implementing that plan, um, and then having the supporting data reporting capacity and, and culture. So if you have those elements, you will succeed. Um, and let's go to my last slide, which is really about some lessons 
from what I see just happening in the world. And I must first say that there are amazing things happening in countries across the globe. Um, so yeah, the IFW was irregular, fruitless and wasteful expenditure. That's basically, um, yeah, there's different classifications for expenditure that does not uh, comply with rules and regulations or processes uh, and policies that are in place. Um, um, so I was saying there's amazing things happening around the globe. Um, and I mean, you can you can probably go to almost every country and find something uh, positive that's happening. Um, but just looking just from my personal reflection of, of what happened in the UK um, from around 2000, they went through a number of uh, procurement reforms that eventually ended with this Crown Commercial Service. But essentially what that is, it's also basically kind of like a central body responsible for policy, but also responsible for um, centralized uh, uh, procurement. Um, and what they're wanting to do there is leverage the buying power of government as a collective. Um, but what they've also done is they've um, built a, a capability with commercial expertise. So what that, what that means is they have highly, let's say, uh, qualified individuals working on specific commodities and categories. Um, and I, I was gonna mention this a little bit later, but basically I find it a little bit unfair to expect an SEM official to be proficient in procuring goods, services, and works. I mean, these types of um, procurement are highly specialized. Um, so you need to also differentiate your staff. You need staff who specialize in procuring goods and others who specialize in procuring services and others who specialize in you know, construction and works. Um, so, and, and this is what's happening, um, but the Crown Commercial Service really looks at the transversal uh, goods and services uh, that uh, government needs. They put framework uh, contracts in place. They uh, look at achieving value for money and really saving time. Saving time because not every government department then has to go through the same, let's say, pain of um, um, having a procurement contract in place. Um, so that really makes it easy um, for departments to procure certain common goods and services. A similar initiative happened in uh, Colombia um, about 10 years ago. They established this national procurement agency. Um, what was really encouraging there is that the initiative was spearheaded by the president. Uh, if you know the history of Colombia, it's... Um, Let's say it's a tough uh, environment to be um, involved in government. And what they did was they brought in expertise from public and private sector institutions to lead this uh, agency and to modernize, uh, to reform public procurement and to modernize, also to do select uh, central procurement. Um, and yeah, they were also able to save uh, government, uh, you know, billions of dollars. Um, Estonia is a very interesting country to look at. Um, it was also about 15 years ago that they had a president who was very passionate about digitalization. Um, Estonia is known as the um, leader on e-government. Um, so basically any... Um, what would you call that? Any government service is available online from home affairs to education, to health. Uh, they, they use digital solutions for everything. And they've recently launched a new enhanced uh, public procurement uh, system solution for, um, for what? For procurement, for tenders, for submissions, for awarding, for contracts. And what does that do? Um, what are the what are these common themes that I'm seeing? The one is there's this theme around transparency, um, strengthening transparency so that citizens can hold government to account. 
um, again, Muhammad spoke about documents that are not um, um, available to the Auditor General. We shouldn't be worried about documents in this age because everything can be digitalized, di digitalized and, and um, you know, saved in, in a safe storage um, and never lost. And we can have an order trail for every single process that happens um, for the evaluation, um, for the authorizations and approvals, um, for the bids that were submitted and the evaluations that were done. All these things can be easily captured on digital solutions. And what that, that does, it immediately strengthens the accountability. Um, so when I look at countries that are, let's say, um, uh, doing well in the public procurement space, I would say that there are countries that have adopted um, digital solutions, um, that have good e-government procurement systems. Uh, to some extent, they have centralized certain uh, procurement. Um, many of these centralized procurement, let's say, activities are not, um, what would you say, uh, like compulsory to, to participate in. Um, departments and ministries can still engage in their own procurement, um, but then they are benchmarked against those prices of the, of the central uh, uh, contracts. Um, the last thing I want to mention um, is that there are two interesting global initiatives. The one um, is the Open Contracting Partnership. Um, this is a, 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 let's say, a global program aimed at strengthening transparency in all governments across the world. They have a standard called the Open Contracting Data Standard, and really their intent is to make procurement data readily available to citizens so that we can improve accountability and transparency of procurement transactions, which really means stopping corruption and um, yeah, uh, poor practices. The other uh, interesting global initiative is the Global uh, Procurement Partnership. Uh, this is an initiative uh, headed by the World Bank. And what they have developed on the one hand is something called MAPS, which is a, a, a methodology to assess a, a country procurement system. Um, you could also use it to assess a, a procurement system or maturity within a particular, let's say, ministry or department. Uh, but it is designed also to look at a country, countrywide procurement system. And what the Global Public Partnership is also doing is um, developing good practice guides uh, and promoting solutions to, um, yeah, basically to improve public procurement globally. And again, one of the uh, learnings out of the engagements is the fact that we need to, to modernize, we need to adopt digital solutions that is going to contribute to efficiencies um, around public procurement. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and apologies for that little glitch in the beginning, but thank you very much. Without any further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Len, who is then uh, going to wrap up these two uh, great speakers that we've just had. And, and speak about uh, some of the lessons learned and is professionalization the way to improve our audits. Dr. Len, we're gonna try as well to see if you can share. Uh, if not, I am on standby. So I will stop sharing now. Well, perhaps Dr. Len is not in the room. He did mention earlier that he is um, in the throes of um, uh, load shedding. And it looks like he may not actually be part of the room anymore. Dr. Len? Okay, 
it sounds like he's he's not with us. What I would like to then suggest is that we have had really two dynamic speakers that have shared with us. I'm actually at this point going to open up the floor um, for anyone who would like to ask some questions. Um, I will also then take this opportunity to go and look at the chat to see if there are any questions that are there. But at this point, does anyone have any questions they would like to, to ask? You're welcome to raise your hand and then take yourself off mute. While there is a, a, people are deciding whether they want to ask questions, I'm actually going to go to the, the chat. Um, and the first um, question I, I see is coming from Emmanuel, welcome Emmanuel, where he says in some countries, projects in municipalities are usually funded partially by the government and other by foreign donors. When carrying out the procurement process under which law should the procurement process be executed? I do think this perhaps is for, uh, this question is for Mohammed. Sorry not to uh, prepare you Mohammed for the question. I will repeat it um, now that you know that I do believe it's for you. In some countries, projects uh, in municipalities are usually funded partially by government yes. and other by foreign donors. When carrying out the procurement process, under which law should the procurement process be executed? And that's from Emmanuel. Um, host, ch Chair, please, if you permit me, my, I've raised my hand, but probably you haven't seen it, and there are a lot of other hands that are up. I see Walter. Ah, thank you. Only, I see Emmanuel. What I wanted to propose, given that um, uh, Dr. Len is not here, maybe if you would have given about five minutes or so for those in attendance, probably to share um, their, remember, most of, um, of us are experts, their perspective on how professionalization can be able to, you know, help transform supply chain and improve audit outcome. Maybe they might be taught and then then we can then take the question. It's just a proposal. Chair, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm present. Uh, it's just with the load shedding that came back that there was a temporary disconnection. I am here. Okay, perfect, Dr. Lin. Um, if that's the case, I've noted your proposal, uh, Professor Ambe. If you may allow uh, Dr. Len to present, and then I will open up to your proposal at the end of the session. No, thank you very much. My proposal was in absence of Dr. Len Beisie, so that you can keep it aside now. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Len, we can see your slide. I'm going to do exactly what uh, Mohammed and the others did. I'm just going to show my face for a second. Uh, I'm sharing just stopped here in Stambos. So I'm going to put off my video feed and I'm going to do something interesting about Colombia. All that you took me through uh, the load shedding period. Um, if you the in one of the second largest of uh, colleagues, would it be possible? Dr. Len, you may have been muted by the host. If you're not aware, uh, please, please take yourself off. They, they, I think they muted you by mistake. Or perhaps we have lost Dr. Screen? Len. Ah, there he is. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Len. Thank you very much. I'm going to continue. 
My discussion is going to be on professionalization and uh, if it is a solution to the transformation of supply chain and to improve audit outcomes. So the question is simply, uh, to what extent will professionalization help to transform SEM and improve audit outcomes? In order to share what we've learned over, I need to indicate to you that this is a field that is wholly under I'm not sure if it's just myself, but I have lost Dr. Len. Yeah. Dr. Len, if you can hear me. Yes, I can. I'm okay. Sweet. We are unable to hear you, Dr. Lin. We can now see your slides, but we are unable to hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, or we not? can now. Okay, my apologies, I switched networks quickly. Uh, I was on my cell phone the whole time. Um, what we learned was that this field is under-researched and you'll see what happened 2001 up to 2018. If there are any prospective researchers out there, SEM and professionalism is something that is not researched. So perhaps you can explore that as an opportunity. Now, why should we professionalize? Um, first of all, it's about a conscious self-awareness of distinctive shared attributes or an esprit de corps. It's based on an explicit written knowledge base. There's a commitment to apply this knowledge for the social good, according to a strictly adhere to code of ethics and conduct, formalized within an organizational structure of sorts, and there's formal recognition of outstanding performance. What is however not mentioned is this can only happen if there's an oversight body and you belong to one of these bodies that professionalize the industry on behalf of the industry. Now, the professional as a custodian, in my opinion, will ensure that section 217 of the constitution is adhered to. This is also something that we regularly raise with politicians to ensure that we don't drift away from uh, keeping to our own lanes, if I may use that term. Now, the benefits of professionalization, and this is something that I took from people that deliver a company that has done a lot of research on this. There's a defined standard of competence the scalable methods of creating continuous flow of skilled individuals. There's an improved supply chain management outcome. Uh, it creates a sense of identity and prestige. There's a creation of a pool of a skilled workforce and this exponential improvement in supply chain management practices deployed in the country. Now, when ourselves and that is ultimate consulting did some work for GIZ, Pink, and for Mark when he was involved with GOPA as well, we came up with certain tools and we used one of the assessment tools, uh, a maturity assessment tool, which we developed. I redacted the names of these particular municipalities. And what you'll see, there was a very low uh, maturity rating amongst these particular eight municipalities. And there was a causal link between that and audit readiness, as well as a consolidated learning need per municipality. I'm just going to spend a second on this slide. Now, what you will pick up here is, in our opinion, and that is uh, a tool that support the data, there's a critical intervention necessary whenever municipalities have a learning need over and above 
that's using an I developed tool that's competency based within the SEM environment. Again, I redacted the names of the municipalities. What you'll see here is clearly that these municipalities are a huge concern in terms of learning needs at these particular municipalities. So what we picked up, the higher the learning need, the lower the maturity rating, the lower the audit readiness, as well as all the other tools that we used. Unfortunately, the time doesn't allow me to go through all the tools that we used. Tool number eight, indicate, for example, a particular municipality. And if you see, uh, this is also a slide that Mark has used. Uh, we are looking at 70 plus areas of need or areas of speciality in the SEM environment. And you'll pick up in all these green highlighted areas, we found learning needs. About half of what exists in SEM is not sufficiently cover, covered by professional or, um, in our opinion, adequate knowledge in the SEM environment. Now, summary findings of our research was that organizations must employ officials with the correct qualifications, skills, and competencies. You'll also note internationally, we are moving away from performance management the way we knew it before to competency-based performance management, which linked to this finding. Leadership must understand its role in effective SEM and be dedicated to invest required resources. Unfortunately, our finding was that is not so. Leadership did not show adequate interest in looking after its SEM people in terms of commitment to training. They didn't attend, for example, when we engaged with municipalities and we did similar exercises with 16 municipalities across the country. IT infrastructure and alignment with financial data wasn't possible at all. And in some places, we couldn't draw credible SEM spend data, for example, on commodities or service providers, and therefore draw any sense of conclusion on abuse of the system. All the municipalities surveyed are in stress mode as to the general status of their financial situation, with particular emphasis on the SEM matters that manifest itself in the increase in irregular expenditure and improper transactions. That is um, obviously uh, trying to put it mildly, that are emphasized by the AG and media as to the poor or non existent service delivery. Now, these are assumptions that I can make with, uh, I think, some clarity after we did our research. There is a link between maturity of SEM and learning needs of SEM officials. The higher the learning needs, the lower the maturity rate of the SEM unit. Maturity levels should be considered and have considered audit readiness. So I can tell you for a fact, that we did consider audit readiness during our assessments. As far as professionalization is concerned, this is where I come to some conclusion. It should improve maturity levels and audit findings because from our research, we learned as soon as officials or individuals professionalize themselves, and that is either belong to a body or have adequate skills, knowledge, and competencies, there is an improvement in the SEM environment. The above support the need for professionalization of SEM, but there's a caveat. It's not going to help to professionalize the industry if we do it in isolation. Why do I make that statement? Because I believe in the broader sense, there's a need for professionalization of the whole of the public sector and not only SEM. It's a good start, SEM, yes, but if we do not have the capacity to professionalize the public sector, then we are going to keep on with the following, a lack of accountability, 
a lack of consequence management, collusion, fraud, and corruption, regulation, fatigue, leadership's abs absence in training environments. And this, I must tell you, are findings of our own research. Perception that consultation on regulation is not meaningful and that there is a disconnect between policymakers and practitioners. Roles and responsibilities are misunderstood. Ineffective SEM unit structures, for example, in one municipality, and yes, I'm going to name it, Oliver Tambu, district municipality, one official, where there's a budget of billions. This surely must be by design. Non-compliance to own policies and legal frameworks and tender cancellations. These were some of the findings. Now, this is an interesting one that I hope you can later on disseminate when you have the time because I'm not going to spend time on it. All I can tell you is if we look at all the risks in this particular uh, slide, you will learn that most of these risks are not related to the officials. I'm talking about SEM officials, but it's related to influences outside the control of SEM officials. The argument for professionalization of the public sector, I'm very close to the end of my presentation chair. Leadership and strategic HR would result in better recruitment, retention, and development of the best available talent and skills, especially the best possible leadership. Performance management creates an environment of responsiveness, high performance, and clear accountability. Again, there's a need to tweak the way we do performance management. It should be competency-based. Culture establishes a public and people-centered culture of service delivery and customer care along the Bartopele principles. Planning and governance ensures planning, governance structures, people, processes, and systems, infrastructure, and oversight. And these are optimal and aligned to the mandate as defined in the constitution, in the IDP, and applicable legislation. Financial sustainability and management ensure economic and financial viability. There are still people that can't read a balance sheet. Still people can't un understand cash flow. And then finally, number six, ensure sound financial management and budgeting. Latest development, a slide that I want to share with you. This is something that I received today via the RLGM SA WhatsApp channel, a national framework towards the professionalization of the public sector published October 2022. I am so happy about this as long as there is an effort that's going to put towards an outcome uh, for this. In conclusion, there's a need for higher ethical bar within the political leadership at the top to create a model public service. Performance imperative should guide the process of appointing members of the executive such that the best men and women in society should be the ones who lead. Meritocracy in the public service should begin at the top, permeate the entire system. That would be a significant step towards creating a capable developmental state. Professional SEM and professional public sector goes hand in hand. And then two slides that I leave with you, these two, the last two, is there is a plan for professionalization. The objectives, the inputs, the activities and outputs would put you on the path to a professional SEM environment. Please have a look at the slide at the later stage. The, the SEM professionalization framework can be used by governments to define standards, employers to define competency needs, employees to map careers, and institutions of learning to define teaching. And that is my presentation. I hope, Chair, that I didn't inconvenience the audience too much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Len, um, and for providing that um, closure of the, the, two, the three uh, panelists. And um, it, it, it was worth the wait uh, in terms of you coming back online.
at this juncture, I'd like to then really open up the floor for any questions, comments, um, contributions that the floor would like. I know before uh, Dr. Len spoke, um, we had um, uh, Walter did have his hand up. So I will ask him if he still does want to have something to say. Whilst he's thinking about it, I'm going to go to Reverend Charles because I do see that uh, Reverend Charles does have his hand up. Reverend Charles, please go ahead. I just feel excited about the last presentation and actually the wrapping up of the two. Because um, if we divorce the this local government, as we can, we are, we, we are calling them anyway, in other countries that are called like county governments where I am is the county. And these are surviving on political, uh, you know, life of uh, every five years or something like this, they like new people who are leading. And what they come is to wipe up anybody who is in the office. And this, it doesn't matter whether you are a professional or whatever, and that's very, very uh, serious. So people struggle to be professionals and then you fear to work for the public sector and then we get that uh, hiccups. And I think the last one was very, very, you know, it's touching my heart because uh, we are suffering from that. But I think with the time that will be cured. The only thing now I want to say is uh, the level of us, professional supply chain management. Uh, we are, especially the public sector, we are depending too much on the auditor general, the general everywhere. I saw that the approach you have in, in South Africa, we have this local government association, which is like us, another oversight kind of pushing, and that is a key. Uh, it's a plus in other countries, nothing like that even exists. And if that approach is made, that will help so much. And then we have come to this uh, professional, you know, uh, uh, institutions or bodies. I think they are also just existing, but most of the time, uh, they, they, I don't know what fear are, but this is why. ASCA has been fronting to make sure that, that we are talking from the same table, I mean, a platform in, uh, in Africa. And I, I think I want to congratulate those who have been fronting this. And I think if that happens, then we shall have at least lower levels of, uh, and I like also the idea of uh, not just uh, performance management, but competency-based management. And that's something which came from the UN also. And that, for me, it's just like being emotional on this and uh, saying this was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for everybody who has done this. And uh, that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Charles. Um, we then have uh, Santi, uh, who has her, has her hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, Chairperson, and also to the presenters, and I see there's a note also from um, another colleague, David Kutsia, to what extent do you think will we be able to implement a transversal procurement system for local government? Now, that is not all in all uh, my comment. I think in any best practice environment, um, I, and, and there was also a reference by Mark to digital solutions. Um, compliance should be driven by by a system and the process flow um, to a large extent as well. That is seriously, seriously lacking in local government. And I think um, maybe if we can get feedback from, and not necessarily looking at the metros or um, uh, uh, government spheres, spheres that can afford uh, more expensive systems, but I think this is really an important note about the transversal procurement system, but I think it'd be very interesting if there is somebody who can share um, a very good experience in what they've achieved. Um, yeah, and also in terms of digital solutions, but I, I believe also I support um, uniform and possibly transversal systems in that regard. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much, Santi. And Santi has opened up her question to everybody in the room, uh, requesting that we um, share if they, they do have experiences. 
Um, so thank you very much for that, uh, Santi. I'll allow the room to think about it um, whilst I go to Walter, uh, who has his hand up as well. Walter? Thanks, Chair. Um, I think uh, we really appreciate the time spent on this um, platform. Uh, I want to thank the three speakers, uh, Dr. Len, Mark, and uh, Mohammed. Uh, we really appreciate your insightful presentations. Um, I think my question goes to uh, um, Saga. Um, I think uh, having, having read almost all the AG report, uh, particularly on the MFM a space um, which deals with um, um, the local government um, and municipal space. Um, the, the report always had uh, poor governance, um, instability and political interference as one of the, um, the causes of these um, instabilities within this um, um, spheres of government. And um, when I look at it is that um, we, we have uh, the, the councils that are supposed to provide governance together with their impacts. And um, I, I wanted to understand um, if the saga is doing something in terms of um, identifying the root cause of these challenges because um, it doesn't matter what we may try to do as professionals. As long as we still have councils that are led by people that in many instances are illiterate, are not able to provide their um, um, governance responsibilities as well as ensuring accountability within, within those space. That would um, continue to have the same challenge because it doesn't matter even if you want to improve capacity within the professionals, as long as people that are supposed to provide an oversight are not doing that. The, this is evidenced by the fact that almost 89% of the, of the irregular exp expenditure that we identified in the previous year or financial year has not been closed. And this process is supposed to be um, monitored by the impacts, which they are, not, they are not necessarily doing. So I want to know, uh, because this might be a legislative problem, because um, I, I, I view the local government space as almost similar to um, a, a basic education space where you have uh, uh, parents that some of them in rural areas might not be illiterate, interviewing a principal for a principal post. And we expect them to identify a person with correct capabilities and competences to be able to execute their work. And, and you do understand that having been not be able to um, uh, be learned to a particular extent, you might not be able to comprehend certain things. So my view is that um, some of these cancers are actually out of depth with what they're supposed to be doing. And therefore that raises a question on what are we doing in terms of the legislative framework to ensure that um, people that operate within the council, they've got certain level of competences. That that may be um, a metric and plus uh, something that is required because you will find some municipalities, a mayor cannot even read a speech that has been written by their speech writers. And we expect this person to really comprehend the, the veracity of the challenges that they face within the space. So that, that exacerbates the problem because People that are supposed to oversee the process, they're not able to provide that. So the question, as, as it may, is that what is it that is being done to deal with those gaps that I've already identified? Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. Um, I do see you, Emmanuel, but I would like to give the presenters an opportunity to respond to some of the comments and also specifically um, the questions that have been asked. And then I will come to you, Emmanuel. Should we start with um, Mohammed? Or may I then say we'll start with any of the three panelists if they would like to um, provide some comment or um, to any of the questions or the comments that have been asked. Um, uh, Chair. Go first, Len. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, a quick one. As far as I'm concerned, I think Santi's comments are spot on. Uh, transversal tenders is something explored by National Treasury and the OCPO. And I think they are looking at trying to uh, centralize 
a lot of the procurement that deals with things like banking and, um, and, and travel and all those things. But if I can share an example that I'm busy with at the moment, uh, Central Kuru District Municipality and um, Garden Root uh, District Municipality are looking at a transversal tender to appoint a panel of training service providers so that they are ready to apply for local government CETA funding. It's something that they are busy with. Uh, that's a nice example of a very low-key practical uh, approach to something that exists as a need. I do not see enough of this. I believe more district municipalities and local municipalities should get together and uh, collectively decide on needs and via a proper demand management plan and procurement planning, do transversal tenders. I think there's a lot of scope for this. I also believe that the city of Cape Town and others that have systems like SAP, et cetera, could and should be able to offer assistance to smaller municipalities that doesn't have capacity. This is the age of cooperation, I believe. Thank you very much. Yeah, so maybe just to add um, on the digital side. So I, I think I must say that there are some uh, exciting things happening in the OCPO in terms of um, modernizing, um, let's say, IT to support public procurement. Um, their focus is more on national and provincial, but there's definitely uh, an overflow into the local government sphere um, with things like the central supply database, the uh, tender portal, um, e-tender portal. They're also now looking at other um, let's say, uh, solutions to help with some of the transversal contracts, making it easier for government departments to participate on those transversal contracts. Um, I think <laughs> it is strange that um, there, are, there are some amazing IT solutions out there. Um, we, we piloted something in a municipality um, to help with um, the publication and receipt of tenders, the evaluation of tenders, um, the document management, and the provision of a comprehensive order trail uh, up to contracting. Um, amazing solution. Um, yeah, council didn't like it. Um, I think there was a bit of a clash between, let's say, political agendas and uh, municipal efficiency and operations. Um, so you do need political will for this kind of change to happen. Um, it also doesn't make sense necessarily that the city of Cape Town um, has, you know, an ERP system that has amazing procurement capability, um, but other municipalities have to struggle. Um, can we not have a national solution? Again, it takes significant uh, leadership from the OCPO, from the Ministry of Finance, um, and even from, let's say, the presidency. So I think there's huge potential for solutions, um, but we do need political will and support to support the adoption and the implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Very much for that. I'm going to go back to the room and say, uh, Emmanuel, you did have your hand up. Okay, perhaps Emmanuel uh, decided not to, con the, perhaps you answered Emmanuel's question and that's why the hand went down. Looking back in terms of the room, are there any other um, questions? Does anyone want to raise their hand? I'm not convinced that uh, Walter was uh, answered, but perhaps Walter, if you do feel that you were answered, you can advise. Okay, I'm going to then at this uh, juncture, I see that there are quite a few um, questions or comments 
uh, within the chat, which I will also then just go over and have a look at uh, and read them out at this at this point. Um, there is a comment coming through that I appreciated the aspect of public service professionalization because SCM professionalization can't be in isolation. And I think that's a response to yourself, uh, uh, Dr. Len, when you were speaking on the professionalization part. Um, and it's real, it is key that there needs to be an overall professionalization within the public services uh, and not just uh, SCM professionalization. Another comment here is for coming from Christo, who says, I would like to stress the need for investment in data analytics within, local, within the local government sphere, data and information management to support um, developmental, and now I can't see the rest of, developmental compliance, et cetera, and the objectives. So I think here you then see the um, more uh, people echoing the, the the importance of uh, technology and the importance of data um, to also then assist in, in transparency, which is what uh, Mark also spoke to um, earlier on. Whilst I'm going through some more of the comments, I would also just like to uh, make us uh, ask if anyone does have any questions or even comments. Santi did also ask, if anyone else in the room has some examples, um, in, also if anyone would like to contribute to that, I'll allow you to take an opportunity to raise your hand and ask the particular question. Whilst you are thinking about that, there have been some requests uh, for the presentations, um, just to uh, inform everyone that yes, the. Um, the presenters have been quite gracious in saying that they will avail the presentations. They are in the chat box right now, but you can also contact Aiska um, to get a hold of the presentations as well. But you can take uh, get them from the chat during this particular session. Are there any other questions? I see, Santi, that your hand is up. I'm not sure if it is an old hand or it is a new hand. So I'll give you an opportunity to advise. Thank you, Chair. No, uh, and thank you, if I may. Just another thought to leave with you. We are looking at the professionalization of supply chain practitioners, but I think there's another elephant in the room also in terms of local government, and I believe in other spheres of government as well, where you have a, a technical team and project managers who is responsible for the uh, compilation of technical specifications, et cetera, but um, they are not always um, capable, uh, yeah, let's put it uh, that way, or, or, or else, alternatively, they don't see it as their role to attend to the um, comprehensive and, and um, specific compliance of technical and pre-qualification um, requirements. Thank you, Chair. A views on that, maybe from our three presenters. Thank you very much, Santi. Uh, Santi has asked a question, and um, she's actually made it quite specific to uh, people who may be looking at the technical specification. I'd yeah. actually like to broaden it and say that there are a lot of people who actually touch our process in terms of supply chain, but uh, are not necessarily um, knowledgeable in terms of the practice and aspects of professionalization of SCM doesn't touch them. So even beyond just those who are looking at the technical space, uh, technical specifications, as Santi said, but um, anyone and everyone who touches the space. Views from uh, Mark, Dr. Len or Mohammed, if he's still in the room. Yeah, I'm sure we can all talk about, um, you know, the role of the bid committee system, um, their effectiveness uh, and their ca ca capacity and competence. Um, the challenges with uh, the specifications committee. And I think as Santi is saying, you know, also ownership from project owners. Um, I mean, there's often uh, real challenges with the quality of, of technical specifications. Um, 
you know, which which gives further challenges down the line. Um, so definitely from all the research we've done and every capacity building solution we've put together, there's usually a focus on building the capacity of, of management and the bid committee system uh, to understand their roles and responsibilities, um, the functions that they need to perform, um, helping them um, with the, the skills to develop specifications and evaluation criteria. Um, and yeah, and, and more than that, also going to the MM level um, to make the MM aware of the importance of supply chain management. Um, I mean, it's amazing when a municipal manager does realize <laughs> how SCM is there to support them, achieve their objectives, and ultimately, you know, make the municipality look good. Um, so, you know, raising, let's say, the, 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 the profile of, of SCM within a municipality. Um, yeah, I'm sure Len can, can add, and, and I'm sure Mohammed as well. Um, I'll, I'll just add um, for one or two seconds, I'm not going to be long about this, but uh, Mark, uh, what he didn't mention was he was uh, the one that commissioned uh, some of us to develop uh, material uh, for training purposes and mentorship uh, and coaching, etc. Uh, there's uh, such a lot of material out there that sits with National Treasury as the custodian, because whenever we develop for GIZ or GOPA and others, uh, SECO, uh, et cetera, this would be this Germ German and, and, and Swiss governments. They were all gracious enough to say, listen, we are not going to take ownership. You, NT, can take the ownership and use it as you like. Uh, the other tool that I'm also a little bit disappointed in not being used more often would be the iDevelop tool, which is an assessment of competencies, which was written. And it's a, it's a proper assessment of all roles within the SEM environment. And you can do a proper assessment of each and every person. And we can establish the learning needs and we can develop a, a a customized training and, and personal development plan for each and every individual. Those tools all exist. It's under the custodianship of uh, National Treasury. All we have to do is engage with them and ask them to deploy and support. Uh, and if necessary, then uh, you can use, uh, you can direct your questions through this forum so that uh, we, we don't seem biased. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much for that. And also that, uh, that nugget of, of information as to where we can look uh, and get assistance in terms of developing our competencies. And thank you also, uh, Mark, as well, um, for, you know, for your contribution. And I see that you've also um, written in the chat in terms of where we can get the tool as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm also noting the time that it's quarter to five um, and we really had a great uh, um, presentation. Are there any other questions from the floor? Anyone would like to raise their hand to ask a question? Whilst they're thinking about it, I do want to just make a comment with, um, and I might actually uh, pronounce the name very wrong. I'm gonna say David Kutsier. Um, has really been placing some very interesting comments um, in the chat. Um, some of them looking that it depends on political and leadership will to make things work. Um, so thank you very much, uh, David Kutia. And I don't know if you'd like to uh, take yourself off mic and, and make uh, some comments. Um, I'm just reading one of your your, your chats. Jeez, no thank pressure. You so much. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Yes, we all can. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. I've been involved in uh, transversal procurement with a state IT agency for the period 
1998 through to about 2013 on information technology per transversal procurement. And um, as many of the people on the panel know, the famous IFMS, Integrated Financial Management System, that never came into being, is uh, one of the entities on which a billion rand was spent and not one computer switched on. And um, I normally refer back to that project. Uh, it was technologists that drove the project. It, it wasn't uh, in the political will or executive leadership will, my opinion, to make it work. And if you come back to the successful implementation of any information systems project in government, whether it's transversal or whether it is um, for a specific institution, uh, it's, a, it's the will at the top that brings the success. It's absolutely back to the ownership of the information system. And then also one of the previous speakers spoke about proper specifications. And that's another place where information system tenders or contracts or projects fail because there isn't, any, isn't adequate specifications for information systems. So back to uh, the basics, if we are looking at establishing a transversal procurement system, we need to start with uh, leadership and proper specifications. And it might take a whole couple of months, even a year or two, to develop proper specifications for this. But um, if I remember correctly, I think Zambia implemented a transversal procurement system about three, four years ago. Um, that, that was a, a successful project. So we will be able to learn from the past. We will be able to learn from our metros where systems are implemented successfully and maybe even um, if we manage projects correctly and initiatives are driven at the right level, maybe even extend the metro solutions to local government. Technologically, everything is possible, whether there is um, political and strategic leadership capacity to drive these uh, initiatives, that is what makes or break a uh, proper system. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm glad we've, we took you off mic because you did have some insights to share. I'm going to go finally um, to the chats and take a last round in terms of um, talking to the chats and also giving a last round for opportunity for anyone who would like to raise their hand. There's a question from Andre who says, are the Salga toolkits and good practice guides that Muhammad spoke about available online somewhere? And I'm not sure if Muhammad is here to be able to answer that question specifically. If he, if he is not and, um, and there is no one else in the room from Salga who can answer this particular question, I will then indicate to Andre if he can then just um, address that question to Aiska and we can get back to you. The question is, are the Alga, Salga's toolkits and, and good practice guides that Mohammed spoke about available anywhere online? Okay, with that, and I see that there are no other questions, I want to give both um, uh, Dr. Len and Muhammad, I mean, and uh, Mark a, a last opportunity to, to maybe just two minutes to say some closing comments before we then close the, the session for today. Dr. Len, would you like to go first? Let, let me quickly go first. Okay, um, go Mark, go ahead, thank I'm you. I'm also gonna run. Um, yeah, no, no, I think, I mean, it, the, it's challenging. It's challenging. And what I would want to say is, that, you know, don't be discouraged. Um, there are amazing initiatives and successes, uh, both in South Africa and abroad, uh, across Africa. Um, yeah, someone just mentioned the, 
the the e-government procurement system in Zambia that was implemented. Uh, they, I mean, they're still busy with the rollout, but I mean, it has it's 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 gone it's gone pretty well. And um, so these solutions exist, uh, and it's true we do. We need political will. We need leadership. Um, but we are making progress. Um, I think the team uh, within the OCPO in in South Africa that's working on ICT is really progressive. Um, and I know that they've got, you know, a plan to enhance the, the existing solutions. So for me, that's encouraging. Um, and yeah, I would definitely say to, to anyone outside of South Africa, um, you know, try and drive transparency. If you can get transparency um, into public procurement, uh, a lot of your other challenges will be resolved quite easily. Um, but thank you to... Uh, I'm not even sure how we pronounce this, Ayeska, uh, for this event, for bringing everyone together. I think it's great that we can have these conversations and uh, that we can collaborate together. So over to you, Dr. Law, uh, Mortimer. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I can just confirm what Mark has said over the last couple of years, five years. I can confirm that all the work we did in capacity building was uh, sponsored by uh, either other governments or national treasury. There's a, a repository of information, lessons learned, products uh, that I believe would add a lot of value. The last comment would be that uh, we did a lot of research on professionalization, and I believe that there are examples that can be um, used in our case as long as there's a forum and there's interest in the industry and the industry organize itself, get together. And if they want, I'm prepared to share as much information uh, that I have collected over the last couple of weeks on the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, to both Dr. Len and Mark, and in his absence, Mohammed. Um, for really uh, engaging us, sharing knowledge, um, challenging us, um, and also really thank you for your dedication to our profession um, and your dedication to the municipalities, the local government sector, uh, in terms of capacity building um, and steering us to more of our municipalities um, gaining clean audits and, and really becoming SCM uh, professionals and, and, and sharing that light. Thank you very, very much for that. And, and I can see in the, in the comments as well, a lot of appreciation for your, um, your knowledge and, and, your, and the time that you spent. Really thank you on behalf of AISCA. As I close, um, I would just like to uh, answer some of the housekeeping aspects that are there. There was a question in terms of, have we had more of these game changer series? Yes, we have them every month. It is normally the, the last uh, Tuesday uh, of the month where we have different speakers coming in and sharing different aspects of S uh, supply chain management. And as you saw from today, really we try and get really dynamic speakers that come through and join us. So please join us for the next one, which will be at the uh, um, end of November, where we will have once again a game changer uh, within the supply chain management space. Secondly, yes, you can contact the AISCA if you're looking in terms of um, presentations that you would like, or you would also like to share with regards to the, um, if you'd like to get access to any of the recordings, you're also welcome um, to do so by contacting AISCA um, and requesting uh, either the presentations or, or the, the recordings of the day. With that, um, I'd like to then uh, wish everybody a great afternoon for those that are slightly behind us in South Africa and those slightly ahead of us a great evening. Um, and look forward to you joining us next week and your great participation um, as we have the November Game Changer series at the last uh, Tuesday of November. Thank you, everyone. And again, thank you uh, to our panelists um, and look forward to seeing you in the supply chain management spaces that you are really making changes within. Thank you, everybody.
Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye.